to be announced on a humanitarian is the most important thing that the people are recognizing you that you are selfless working for the for the for the others and this is the most important word in my life that i i like to hear that the, the people know we are working for the humanitarian issue we are trying to do it is not a, a privilege we are doing our duties for the in for for the other people and this is the most important even than to be so from morally morally and as a feeling i was so happy that i have been chosen as a humanitarian for 2019 uh, and and uh, on the on the stage as they announced my name i i know for 100 percent that uh, there is no competition uh, between the humanitarian work i admire very much the work that my both other colleagues did and uh, I told on the stage, uh, very so from bottom of my heart, emotionally, that I, uh, I said my both colleagues are deserving the same name like uh, like me, and uh, even more. So it's a kind of shock. You will get that, uh, and uh, you say you ask yourself that there are tens of thousands of good people and people who are sacrificing for the humanity. And uh, only you found a, such platform to be announced at. Aurora Initiative gave me a very big global uh, platform to call for the humanity. And now I have obligations. Maybe in the past I could switch off my, uh, switch off reading the news, what's going on for craziness in the world, and switching off and go to make vacation. I think, so in, in the last years, I was working 18 hours a day. I think it should be increased to three, to three more hours, to be 18 hours, more than 18 hours, because there is now an obligation. Maybe I was working concentrated for the Iraqi minorities, Christian, Yazidis, Mandea, Jews in Iraq. Now I have an obligation to think about those people who are living everywhere in the world and suffering from the tyranny and injustice. This is a very big obligation and it's a very big platform uh, and to, to work. And I'm very proud uh, to be one of uh, the members of the, of the Aurora family. Thank you. Can you tell us about the designated organizations that you will be sharing uh, your prize with? Yeah, so the three organizations uh, are uh, Luftbrücke Iraq uh, that we have established 12, 12 year, uh, years ago uh, that will work mainly in the, with the victims of the genocide uh, in Sinjar area. It will implement some sustainable uh, programs uh, to help mental health, uh, social health for the, for the women and children and also to th strengthen the community because the community there are uh, we have 80% uh, of the community are still in the refugee camps, so we will try to find through this organization, through this uh, um, the giving uh, uh, of Aurora uh, Prize uh, to strengthen the community there and encourage the people and to establish a platform for peace building and reconciliation. This is the first organization. That's, the second one is Seed Foundation. It's, uh, is based in Kurdistan, in Iraq. And the Seed Foundation is working in, uh, in the educational side for um, the um, uh, trauma and helping the GBV victims in generally in Kurdistan, the victims of the war and also uh, domestic violence against women and these things. They have very nice programs for helping the victims. They have some shelters to help uh, the victimized women in the community. You know, the community in Iraq is still a patriarchal community, so the woman is suffering, and we have a long way uh, for challenges to fight for the rights of the women. And the third organization is a Shai Fund, is an American organization that was working with the Christian communities in different parts of Middle East, in South Sudan, in Egypt, in other countries, and also in Iraq. They are active in Ninawa Plain. Uh, 
uh, Christian community in uh, in Iraq is uh, also very vulnerable because we had, uh, you can imagine, we had in 80 about one and a half Christian, uh, one and a half million Christian in Iraq. Now we have less than 200,000. So you can imagine, although the Christianity, the land of the Christianity is there, we have 80 percent of the Iraqi community was until the fourth century Christian. So you can imagine we have some churches who are 1,500 1, years old, and everything is, is under danger. So those three organizations will get the prize. What is the importance of Aurora Prize, especially personally for you? The importance of Aurora Prize for me uh, is that this prize was, uh, was founded um, by uh, the grandchildren of Armenian genocide, the survivor of Armenian genocide. So, and those people, uh, and I heard many times from, from Robin and Nubar, the co-founders of this organization, uh, heard many times of, from them that they don't like feel themselves as victims. So they have to try to change something, to have some impact in the world toward the humanity, and we don't like. And me, as, a, as one of the survivors of the Yazidi genocide in 21st century, it is bringing this message of the humanity and distributing this message of the humanity through the humanitarian, through the laureates of uh, last years and the, the, and the coming years and the humanitarian, and also s through the ambassadors of the, of the Aurora Forum. We, this is the one, the, I, I think it's the biggest network in the world that is not in the direction of the politics, it's only in the direction of the humanity from those people who are in direct in touch with, with the victims. So to bringing this, this message is very, uh, very important. And this is the importance of Aurora. We learned about your journey that you went through. Uh, what were your inspirations? So I have also, just like you, I'm an ordinary uh, um, young man or no more young man from a farmer f families. So I had very important uh, step in the land. One of them was actually in 2007, as I saw Al-Qaeda terrorists attack two Yazidi villages from innocent civilians who didn't do anything, villages in the some forgotten area, southern side of Sinjar, even they haven't, they haven't uh, the drink water, you can imagine that, and they sent two truck bombs to these villages and killed 300 people. and and injured 850. And I started spontaneously a, a humanitarian campaign fundraising in Germany. We, we, we collected about 140,000 uh, euro within one week uh, uh, from the Yazidi and the German communities. And we brought that money to, to Iraq. And we distributed all that money to to the orphans, to the families of the victim, but I visited also the hospital because there was many uh, children, many many injured people there that we have to give them some money. So, uh, and I saw those children, innocent children. They didn't do anything. Only uh, they, the the only uh, sin that they had, they were in this moment in the market as the truck bomb came. So. And therefore, I decided to, to help them, and I helped some of them. And I made the Airbridge Iraq or Loftbrook Iraq to help other Iraqi children. And the other impact that I had in my life, that once I brought some uh, three children from different parts of Iraq, one of them was uh, Shia, uh, uh, from the Shia community in, in Basra, nine years old. And he was, uh, he was from very poor family in, uh, in a small city. And he was walking on the street selling uh, small things, gums and these things because to help his mother. And suddenly was a fighting between al Sadr militias and uh, UK armies in 2008. Uh, in, that, in that moment of fighting. And he was uh, one of the collateral damage. He lost his leg. And I wanted to bring him to Germany for the treatment. This was my first, and he, he could speak only Arabic, and no other language. And the, my, my second child was uh, one from the Turkmenian Kurdish family, Sunna, from Kirkuk, and he was six years old. And this child, 
uh, uh, was actually son of one of the, uh, the policemen in, in Kirkuk. And in the day of the celebration of uh, fasting, uh, Islamic fasting, Ramadan, one came to the door and gave him a, a, a bag and told him this is the present of the Eid. And uh, he took this present and it was a bomb and it has exploded and it has, uh, um, the, he, he lost his eyes through this uh, explosion because it was very near to him. The body was burned and he lost one of his hand, uh, of, of arm. And the third child was three years old uh, child with a big tumor in the face. I, uh, and I, I could have an opportunity to, to treat her. She was from Erbil. So we had a long journey to fly from Baghdad to, uh, to a transit over Istanbul, then to, to uh, Munich, then by train six hours to my house. And usually I had two, three uh, uh, hospitals in, uh, around uh, our area and they offered free treatment. But you know, in German they are, you give them, a, you should give them an appointment and it should be there. And to, to become visa and bring those people and to arrange it. So usually I didn't make appointment until the children arrived in Germany. So I took the children to my house. This was I did every time. Uh, but three children were two, uh, and I had a volunteer. He said, okay, that both boys can come to my house. And uh, my wife said, uh, we can take the, the, the small girl because maybe the people will don't like her face. So let's keep the girl in our house and give the volunteers or give the volunteers the two boys. Anyway, so in the evening, the, the guest father called me and said, Mirza, please can you come? We have a Shia Sunnah uh, uh, fighting in my house. I said, what, Shia Sunnah? He said, because we were on the dinner and the nine years old uh, boy asked me, uh, uncle, he, his name was Hadi, uncle Hadi, do you like Imam Khomeini? So the, although the other child, the Sunnah child, he didn't understand was this, the language because he was Arabic, the other speak Turk Turkmen language and Kurdish, but he started to make a song uh, against Khomeini and the other in Kurdish language. So the other Shia guy, he didn't understand the language, but he knew that he is making the name of Khomeini in a melody. He started to, to uh, speak bad words about the Sunnah leaders from the history, so from Sahaba and uh, Imam Umar Ali, uh, and, and Abu Bakr, and they fought, it and they fought each other. So he said, can you please save us? So I, I took the, the Shia uh, boy from his family and gave it to a German. After one day, the, the Sunnah boy asked Hadi, he was a Yazidi, he asked him, uh, what's your religion? And Hadi said, I am Yazidi. He said, you have no Quran at home? He said, no. Then he started after the lunch, he started to put his finger in his mouth. He said, your, your food is haram. I am not allowed to eat your food. I am not going to eat here. And he was starting to cry. So I wanted to tell you this, this example because it has shocked me. And I called the, the father of both actually, but I started with the, with the young Sunnah boy. And I called him, I said, do you know I am a Yazidi? He said, yes, I know. I said, do you know that the church is funding the hospital that I am bringing your child there? And the, 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 the church is completely funding this hospital? He said, yes, I know. I said, do you know that the host families either are Christian or Yazidis or, it's not every time a Muslim family will not find that we have also some very, very nice Muslim families who are volunteering, but you will not find every time some free people. So I said, what can I do with your child? He, he, he refused to eat because you say his, your, your, your food is haram. So, but the impact was after two months, he spoke with his son uh, anyway, uh, and he promised me he will not send his son to the mosque where uh, a radical Islam was. But the impact that we has after th I had after two months, the, both children came back to Iraq and their families, we collected, well, they came, I didn't arrange that. Their family came to each other. They visited the family of this Yazidi volunteer who hosted them and they had very good relationship. And I said, okay, now I know that the humanitarian work and the humanism can bring the people together, the human values. 
without to speak about our ethnicity, our religion, our diversity. So this is, this is one of the examples why I see. I, 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 I don't like to, to bother you with other examples of the changing in the life, but please, I am asking every one of you, you will find a, a, a simple moment in your life and you will recognize that every one of you has a meaning in this world, every one of you. This is, we are, we are a part of ecologic system and every one of us, even the, the flies, everything is, has a, a, even the plant, we have a, a reason and we should protect these reasons to protect the world. Thank you. I think it's, it is the, uh, the thing that Aurora Prize is teaching us to. Exactly, this is, the, this is the soul, the spirit of Aurora Prize as well. Okay, thank you for your answers. Uh, if the audience has uh, some questions, please feel free to ask our guest. Yes, please. So what's your key, Sir Mizai, to be a great, successful negotiator? Ah, thank you very much. So I think that if, if you know the, how to use these human values that you are sharing with all both parts, and uh, the best one who can answer the question between two very radical groups, maybe it will be Zana, who has negotiated with those monsters in Boko Haram. But if I would do that, please, if you can answer then, uh, uh, if, if, if I would do that, I will try to find a key of bringing some human values that everybody share and he will not refuse. This is the first one. But please, Zana, say something. Yeah, please. Let me congratulate you, Abel, myself, with the opportunity to congratulate you once again. You have done a tremendous work, and that work will live for eternity. Thank you. So, the world is now becoming a sort of, it's taking a dimension that the bite within itself. There is a lot of polarization. But one thing, that addresses human being for them to stay in a unanimous or in a very peaceful way is that we should understand our diversity. To know the diversity and then whenever there is conflict between one person, there has to be a sort of conflict analysis to know where are the contending issues? If you find out, then, but in certain contexts, it is always difficult first to find an entry point. How do you go into, in between the two? First, you cannot just go like this. Because if you do that, the world will say, oh, you are negotiating with terrorists, which is not there. For that, you have to have a mandate. Like in our own context, when the issues of this Boko Haram crops up, the president of Nigeria, President Mahmoud Buhari, went to the United Nations to say to then Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, to say, I want you to help me to negotiate with Boko Haram. And that's for him to get the international mandate, for him to talk to the other group. If he didn't do that, the world will say, oh, she is negotiating with Boko Haram. As he did this, end, and then he said, I want your own assistance on that. And that was how the mandate was given. And then subsequently, we went and sat on a complex analysis to know who is where and who is holding on to the girls. After these things are done, then that is when you have to find somebody who is impartial. And how do you find somebody that is impartial? Somebody that has not taken position on that. So that was how we, our foundation was established much earlier when the Boko Haram insurgency came into be. Ours was in 2007. But in 2009, that was when it closed up. 
So immediately when these things clubs up, if we are a humanitarian, one, if you are a humanitarian, you don't look for religion, ethnicity, creeds, or any other thing other than are they human, are they worthy to be considered as a human. So if that is done, you don't mind. And that's what informed our idea in 2009 to take the barriers, the two sides of the debate, the security agencies, and the children of the Boko Haram to be in our own foundation. And then, for in a traditional African setting, the wives and the, the, head, the head of the family is the husband. When the husband is no more, the wife is as vulnerable as the child because they don't have any livelihood. So that was why we also brought in the widows to be part of the livelihood we get. But where do we get the entry point? How do we get to the distance? So these widows are the one helping us to text message across. So that was how we were able to strike a balance to get the mediation successful. Thank you. Thank you. The situation of the Yazidis now in Iraq uh, is not better than, the, than before because there is still ongoing genocide in my understanding because I have 80% of the Yazidi community are still refugees in some refugee camps. They cannot return back to this area. At the beginning of attack of ISIS, we had 6,500 6, Yazidi women and children in the captivity after five years, and officially the feeding of ISIS, we have still almost 2,900 women and children in the hand of ISIS. So, and the problem is because of the ideology of ISIS, those people, this ISIS families, even when there is no ISIS as a territory, but those people in Mosul, in Raqqa, in Hol, in other areas, they keep the Yazidi women and children in, them, in their houses and they have been indoctrinized them, brainwashed them, and tell them if you return back to their community, the community will kill you and you will go to the hell because you return back to the infidel Yazidis. So you can imagine that the Yazidi families are still waiting on their daughter or children, some of their children even they lost the language. We had a, a six years old child who even couldn't speak his mother tongue. He was speaking only English because he was in the captivity of uh, an American ISIS fighters and his family. So he could only speak English and he didn't know even who was his father and mother. We have about 80 mass graves uh, of the Yazidi remains in different area of uh, Shingal and Sinjar. And uh, after five years, uh, now uh, the international team started to exhume the bodies of those victims. Uh, and it is very difficult, you know, if, can, if you can imagine you are going every day with your cars beside a mass grave where, where you can find the bone of the victims and you can, you can find his ID somewhere else or his clothes and you show that and they put only something around that, and you are, as a family member, as a family of the victim, you don't know if it is your father or your mother or your sister is or your brother is in this, in this mass grave. You don't know that, and you are not allowed to touch it, and they are not doing that, the government or something else. So you can imagine that, that a, 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 a district with full of mass graves, and they ask you to return back, and you cannot return back because you don't feel safe. And then uh, the, the whole conflict of uh, the Shingal, although it is a neglected area, uh, we, we, we got our first street with, with asphalt in 1979. Uh, first time that we had a TV in 85, as Saddam Hussein was visiting our area and, uh, or not our area, another rural area, 
and they didn't know him. And he said, you don't know that I am president of Iraq? They said, no. He said, OK, every Iraqi family should get a TV. So <laughs> since 85, we got our TV, the first time TV, you know. So you can imagine this neglected area. Now, this area became a, a very interesting area for the international conflict from the one side, Turkey, from the other side, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. Militia supported proxy war in this area. Militia supported from all kinds of, of states and terrorists. So you can imagine how the normal civilian who wants only to go to his farm and come back home and live in peace, how, he, how this guy can return back. So this is the reality, the bitter reality of the Yazid in Iraq now. Uh, we all know that uh, these humanitarian crises are a result of political processes. And uh, what can humanitarian do uh, in political area to prevent new massacre? So every time when I ask myself, uh, the politician, are, the politician, there are good pol pol political people as well, so not uh, every politician is bad, but the, the bitter reality is that we as small humanitarian workers, we are trying to build a destruction that the politician trying to do and are doing since thousands of years. It is unfair, it is unfair competition because for this building, you can destroy it with one bulldozer in two days, but this building, you cannot build it within 10 years or within at least one year. So you can imagine how unfair as the situation of the humanitarian work is. But this will not give us hopelessness. I think we can do some impact. And you know, especially in those democratic countries, the population, we are, we are trying to speak with the heart of the people in order to win them to this human values. And I think there will be more impact. We saw some changes we, even in, in the, the crisis that are coming. The problem is that we are not so strong enough to stop all kinds of tyrannies. Uh, but uh, in, in such platforms, in such uh, activities like Aurora Initiative, this will, be, this will be very stronger to convince the politician and to put more human values in the political measures. That's what I hope. That's what I am dreaming to do with, with the help for everybody, because we are uh, small stones, but if we gather all our stones from China to US to Australia to to uh, to the uh, no North uh, Pole, we will we will change something. Be sure. Do you think it's better to teach those children that there are other societies and they should start accepting those, or to teach the societies that there are ethnicities and religious people that have different practices? We need some reform in educational system. Uh, there is in many countries no sense about the ethic uh, uh, and, and uh, human rights and human values in the, in the uh, education system. I hope that we can make a campaign uh, to encourage the countries to find some or establish some base maybe on the international level, on the UN level, uh, to encourage the other countries or, or to oblige the countries actually to put uh, special lectures for the kindergarten children to the university for the human values and for the coexistence and accept, even in those countries where they have only one, one uh, color or one nation or one ethnicity or one religion. I think it's very important for us to be educated that there are other human beings, they are equal like you, is only different in the opinion, or it may be different in the color, maybe different in the religion or ethnicity or the uh, land or, or the country, but they are just like you in DNA. And if you are aware about the, this system of collecting DNA, so test your DNA and you will find, your, you will find as an Armenian one, you have some roots maybe in China and you have some percent from the China. Because we are all human beings, nothing else. And we, we are, we are even with the, with, the, with, with the animals, because they are part of our ecologic system, even with the plant, only the coexistence can save the world. Only the coexistence can, can save the universe, not only the world. 
and this coexistence, we should find educational system and values to uh, implement it from the childhood. This is very important. And not only the children, for sure, in those countries who have conflict, you should mediate a system of reconciliation. You shouldn't forget anything, but please, you should be ready to, for, to, to, to reconciliate with yourself first and with the others to establish a better future for you and them.